Hey, Archery Talk, this is Lucas, and today I'm having a chance to uh, chat with Dave Cousins. Um, I had gotten some questions from uh, some of our users on uh, Archery Talk and on the YouTube videos about the PSC Archery lineup for target bows. PSC's got a massive lineup of target bows to choose from, so there might be some confusion on where you should go. Uh, and I figured I would, uh, I would talk to someone who knows a lot more about the subject than I do, so I've uh, hit up Dave, and he's been gracious enough to, uh, to help us out with this video. So Dave, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you guys. Oh man, we do we really do appreciate it. Um, so I guess we'll start off with the fact that yeah, like I, I get talked asked a lot about various bow lineups, and for for usually for target archery, it's pretty simple. Brands have one or two bows to choose from, and you kind of pick your poison. PSE, it's got the Citation lineup in multiple setups. They've still got the um, they've still got the Perform X uh, bows and the regular in 3D, and they've got the the, the focus, uh, the super focus and the focus XL, and there's even the laser for the kind of price, uh, price conscious viewers. So uh, which bows are you, are you, do you shoot one bow for everything? Or are you switching from different bows for indoor, for field, for uh, 50, whatever you're shooting? Well, for me, I really like to keep things super, super simple. If I have one particular platform that I like, uh, I'm gonna run that for everything. Uh, unless I have something that I really want a particular platform for because it's just much better suited than anything else. Like back when I, I started my journey with PSC in 2019 uh, for the 2020 season and whatnot, I was just going to compete indoors 18 meters. So my natural gravitation was to go towards the Super Focus XL LD because that was like, it was perfect for what I wanted to do there, which was just shoot indoors. Now, if I was in a position where I was gonna play a lot more games, so to speak, if I was gonna shoot some field, if I was gonna shoot uh, maybe some 50 meter, or maybe some arc yards 3D, then I probably would have gravitated towards something slightly different, kind of like a, a hybrid, something that's a little bit of best of, of all worlds, but not totally 100% dedicated to anything. And you know, for me, that would have been like a Performex platform. You know, something like that, because that's a great all rounder. Uh, there's nothing you can't do with, for me anyway, with a 40 inch bow, with a little bit of reflex to it and some speed. You could shoot great indoor scores. You could shoot awesome outdoor scores. It's just kind of going to be a catch all for everything. But with primarily uh, signing up to just compete indoors for PSE, the super focus was a natural fit. It was basically, it, it ticked every box for the quintessential indoor bow. And that's all I was concerned with. Um, but now looking across the lineup, like you said, it's a blessing and a curse at PSC that we have a bow for everyone. And we have a bow that'll fit every game you want to play perfectly. So for me, it would be a question of uh, talking with a, a customer and saying, trying to learn about their passion. What game is it they like to play? What do they like to do? What is their style? Um, do they live somewhere where outdoors is going to be a dominant thing, you know, in the South, Southeast, uh, you know, do they live in another, a place in another hemisphere like Australia, New Zealand, somewhere where they're going to shoot outdoors primarily all the time? Uh, do you live somewhere like I do in the Northeast where indoors is, that's six months of your life. Um, you know, it, it's just kind of diagnosing what game you want to play, where their passions are, and then looking at a platform that suits that in relation to draw length. Um, overall stature of the archer, you know, are they a fairly tall archer? What, what's their style? How do they like to anchor? What's their kind of dominant head position like? Are they just kind of really diagnosing what game they want to play? What kind of attributes would suit their style in a cam as far as how it draws, how smooth it is, how firm or soft the wall may or may not be? What kind of uh, velocity, speed, and energy uh, can that bow and that cam system produce in the platform it's in? And then what kind of money do you want to spend? You know, do you want to spend $1,800? Do you want to spend $1,200? Do you want to spend $800? You know, it's, it's kind of, there's, there's a handful of questions that, you know, an archer really has to consider. And doing so will help them really get the perfect bow for the game they want to play for the style they have and something that'll fit their recreational budget. Um, and that's a huge advantage for us at PSC where a lot of other companies, it's like, no, we got model a and we got model B and they're both two grand and pick one. 
<laughs> you know, it doesn't give you a lot of optimization, you know, for yourself. You know, you're dealing with a, a gigantic base cam with bolt-on modules and you don't get all the modules when you buy the bow and you either get a 40, well, and, and I guess a 40 inch bow is a long bow these days, you know, so you either get like a 37 inch bow or a 34 or five inch bow and that's kind of it. And if you fall kind of in between some of the catch-alls, then you don't have a cam that's in a position that's optimized for you. You don't have an axle to axle link that fits your form and stature. Um, you may or may not be in a position where you get the performance out of the bow that you wanted, you know, so you kind of have to make some sacrifices. And with a huge, really deep selection at PSE, you don't have to make sacrifices, but you do kind of have to understand what you're looking for a little bit better. So what is it about the, um, the Focus XL that kind of, that you work for you for indoor? Well, uh, first and foremost was um, the overall size and stature of the bow, the axle to axle length, approximately 40 inches. Um, that allowed me to, as I draw, to keep my head position up nice and straight. Anything shorter for me, and my head position becomes compromised quite a bit. And when that happens, then it's a break point in this shoulder and it pulls my back half around. So anything with a really acute string angle is not going to be the bow for me, especially at my draw length with 31 and a quarter. Uh, I, I like I like a bow that fits my stature and my form a lot better in my head position. And being a deflex riser, it was just a natural. It's a bow that's going to be super stable in the sight picture. It's not going to show you a lot of movement under load. And when it, what I mean by that is if the question is asked, when's the most important time a bow needs to be steady? It needs to be steady when you're putting force and resistance on the front half of the shot and the back half of the shot. Basically, when you're trying to get the air to leave the bow, at no other time does the stability of the bow matter more than that time. So going to that platform on the Super Focus XL LD, it was, it had good string angle, good axle to axle that fit my form, deflex riser, so it's going to be a little bit more stable as you're pushing on the fat part and pulling on the skinny part, trying to make it go bang. Um, that was really important to me. Where something with a little bit of reflex or something with a geometry that was a little bit stiffer really wouldn't suit my needs uh, as well as the Super Focus XL LD uh, does. So that so that a more of a reflex riser. What would what would you say would be the ideal kind of like a like a, a discipline for that particular bow? If you're if you're shooting well, your if, if you look at a bow like the Perform X uh, series of bows with a little bit of reflex to it, that would be that's a great bow for field, a great bow for three D still even a really good bow for indoors, but it's like where I had the choice to pick the tool that was absolutely optimized for the job I needed to do, that's why I went with what I went with. Um, if I was gonna shoot everything, if I was gonna be back on the road shooting 25 major events in a year, you know, indoors, outdoors, field, 3D, European field, all that stuff, 50 meter, then I would have picked something with a little bit of reflex just so I was shooting the same platform all the time and not have to change. Um, that That's, what for me like a performax or slight reflex platform would be suited for for a good all round like if i can only have one bow and do everything with it it's going to be something like that so speaking of field um again it's field is absolutely my favorite kind of archery discipline there is it's a, and i know you're you've won as much field as anybody out there can, can you maybe let people know if they haven't tried for 3d people maybe why field is worth kind of looking into well for me uh, field is is the biggest challenge of the archer's ability themselves and i mean fully encompassing it's not just 18 meters there's the target there's the clock you got three arrows you got two minutes hit all the tens and we'll see who's in the shoot off at the end of the day uh no field is all encompassing you have to you have to be a bit of a bow mechanic uh you have to have decent form you've got to have a good durable mental game and stamina that's going to get you through a whole 112 arrows on an NFA field course, which could take all day, depending on where you are, how big the tournament is. Sometimes you can shoot a 28 field in two and a half, three hours. Sometimes it'll take six or seven, you know, so you've got to have that duration, that longevity, not only in your, like I said, in your physical game, but in your mental game. And then every single target on a field range is a puzzle. Every single one is a puzzle piece. It's an intricate puzzle piece. You're going to, First of all, 
gauge the distance. Is the distance right? How does the target face read? Is there lighting conditions that are dictating that arrows are landing in a certain area other than the middle? Um, what kind of slope are you dealing with? Can you get decent footing cut out or is there decent footing enough there so you have a good foundation to even begin to compose a good shot? And then the management of keeping all these things in the air as you're juggling them, solving the puzzle, and then you still have to stand there and shoot those arrows. And you got to shoot them in the middle. And then you go on to the next target, and the next target is a completely new puzzle. And it's more than just one arrow. A puzzle is pretty easy to solve if it's just bam, one shot. Okay, so maybe you hit it, maybe it didn't. Why didn't you hit it? We don't really know. You don't get any other arrows to dive into it with. You know, so with field being three arrows or a four arrow format, you you kind of chip away at the puzzle little by little. And hopefully you get it figured out pretty soon, but you still got two or three more arrows to get in there as well. So it's just, it's the, it's a game for analyticals. It's a thinking person's game. Um, and especially field, you got to be a mechanic. You got to know how to build a. You got to know how to set up a bow, right? You got to know how to build and set up an arrow, right? You got to keep it all completely managed all the way through the day. And from one day to the next, um, it is the most rewarding game when you start to make progress in it, uh, as opposed to some of the other games I play, you know, outdoor 50 meter. It's pretty boring. I mean, honestly, it's the same thing as indoors. There's a clock, there's six arrows, the target's 50, 50 meters away and you just shoot. I mean, you guess the battle there ultimately at the elite level is with the human mind. It's not necessarily solving a puzzle uh, like it would be in field archery. Indoor 18 meter, same thing. Here's three arrows, here's two minutes. Uh, at the end of the weekend, there's gonna be a whole bunch of people with perfect scores and then we're finally gonna go shoot. That's still just a measure of the competitor. It's not really a measure of the game of the difficulty of it itself. You know, in 3D, that is, it, it's still, that's, a a huge, a bunch of variables. And there's just a big umbrella that really covers everything that's gone wrong in that. And a lot of people will kind of hide behind that, you know, oh, well, 3D is my favorite. That target archery stuff is too many arrows and, you know, this or that. Well, you know, usually most of those people are hiding behind 3D because they don't know how far it is. They can't see it. And if they did, and then they could, probably couldn't hit it. You know, so the more games you learn how to play, the more well-rounded you'll be. And diagnosing and finding out what piece of equipment's going to kind of work best for some of those games or finding something that's going to work for everything is super important to that. But Yeah, I just, I just like it, again, as an amateur, um, who, who I, I like 3D as well. I like, I like it all. But when I, when I shoot 3D, I like shooting a lot of arrows. And and I, yeah. and I and I tend to I miss I make, I make bad shots sometimes and I have a chance to fix it on a, on a field course I get I get three more chances to maybe do something right see what I did wrong I just, yeah you I can like work it. through it you can solve the puzzle yeah yeah it's it's the puzzle's largely up here but it's still it's still a puzzle for me and the puzzle uh, usually resides somewhere between the left and right ears most all the time yes yeah. um so on to some questions I guess uh, uh, you answered a couple already I had one was um. One, one of the guys I got from the on Facebook when I posted on the Archer Talk Facebook page, somebody wanted to know how do you set up your front shoulder for uphill and downhill shots? Is there a difference or is it when you're when you're addressing either of those problems? Right. Well, my my front half and shoulder setup is the same regardless of whatever angle I'm shooting on. And typically before I draw, I don't start at the horizon. I'm always going to start slightly above my target, whether it's super steep uphill or super steep downhill. I mean, my front half is gonna hinge completely at my hips. I'm gonna do my absolute dead level best to maintain my proper upper body posture and biomechanics, but I always set exactly like I would if I was shooting anything else on level ground, but I've got to camber my body into a position so that when I'm done doing whatever it is I'm doing, I'm pretty much on my target. And that involves me, you know, with a pre-aim position, getting downhill onto that target or uphill onto it. Uh, it's really the same process. I am not a proponent or advocate of setting, drawing, and then I just think that's a ton of wasted body movement and, and potential strength and energy and stuff like that. It's just 
whether it's right or wrong, it's not my style. Fair enough. Appreciate it. Um, another question we had in here was, uh, I guess, on the mental game. When you're, is there is there anything you do specifically to prepare mentally for a tournament? And then, and when you're on the shooting line, when you're getting ready to shoot in a high pressure spot, is there is there something you're focusing on? Absolutely, and and it is the most uh, physically and mentally demanding thing to do, and not so much in a tournament because you know you have to do it. Um, but in practice and training, like before we got on the call this morning, I got up, I was shooting and the most demanding thing to do in practice is to go through a shot routine and run a mental management system when you're sitting here in your own shop with no pressure, nothing going on. It's, but that's where it pays the most dividends. And before every shot, I'll try my absolute dead level best. And even at my level, it's hard because it gets boring to, first of all, what do I want to do with this arrow? Okay, what are the three or four things I need to do well to get this arrow where I want it? Go through those steps, draw up, go through them, arrow leaves the bow, it's in the target. And then before reacting to where that arrow is, or how you might have gone about shooting that arrow, I always ask myself two very deliberate questions. What did I do well? What will I do better? And what did I do well? Well, that is praise, that builds self-confidence, that builds a more positive self-image of your abilities and your capability. It, it teaches you that it's okay to push your comfort zone to be better. This is what you're doing good. And then the second part is goal setting. What will I do better? It tells me the things that I will execute better during the next shot. All too often, people will shoot, and the first thing, they'll react to where the arrow is, not how it left. And they'll be like, oh, I did this wrong, I did that wrong, I did this wrong, I did that wrong. You're reinforcing the negative of it. So having the discipline to do that every single arrow in practice, for me, is the biggest hurdle, but it's also the most rewarding. Now, doing that in a tournament is not difficult at all because there are consequences if you don't. You're, you, those consequences are forever looming over you in an event, in a tournament. And you're going to put forth maximum effort in a competitive situation more so than you will in just a training or practice situation. So that, for me, on the mental side, is the most demanding thing. And, and that's a very simple thing I do. I ask myself those two questions, and I'll be very honest. What did I do well during that shot? what will i do better during the next one I, that's a it's it's an interesting thing because I, I as a just a i'm an amateur i'm just a i'm a hacker but i my my first impulse when i do something is is just a is is this kind of the self deprecation like ah, I, i'm that was dumb i could do i i focus on my mistakes so i, I think probably focusing on the positive would uh, would benefit me and probably a lot of other people that are in a similar position it's human nature too. I mean, we, we, we put in so much effort and passion into this simple act that might take anywhere from five to 10 or 15 seconds to get an arrow from point A to point B. And sometimes it feels like the whole weight of the world hinges upon it when, it's, when it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ultimately nobody cares but you, what you're doing. There. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, but sometimes, it's just, sometimes you don't even care. Yeah, but it feels but it just so that it, it does feel like there's there's so much riding on 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 ultimately what is nothing, but it's a, it, it weighs on my it weighs on my brain. I don't know how, if, I don't know if other people have the same issue. Yep, and I think that speaks to the passion that we put into this sport. You know. Yeah. All right. So an, another question somebody asked. And I know this is something that could go on for a long time. So we'll get to do a quick nickel tour on this one. But when you're when you've got a bow, brand new out of the package, PSC sends you sends you a new rig. What is your what's your what's what's kind of the order of your setup process? First foremost thing I'm going to do, get the bow out of the box. <laughs> More than likely, they haven't set the module right in my draw link, so I'm going to have to set that where it needs to be. Um, then I'm going to set the draw stops for my approximate let off, which for me is is right in the middle of the draw draw length slots. Uh, the 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 draw stop has three spots on it. It's like 65, 70, and 75. I'm going to set it for what they call 70. percent um, Going to even out the tiller going to set my peak weight, going to double check my holding weight, going to double check my timing and whatnot, make any finite small adjustments I need to make there. Uh, going to set my knocking point, going to set my peep height approximate to start, going to set center shot, 
you know, basically just eyeball center shot left, right. Cause you're probably going to have to move it anyway. Um, you know, approximately set, you know, launcher pitch height, et cetera, cable guard offset, probably going to set it up for my cable guard to give me as minimal clearance as I can get away with. Uh, bear in mind, you know, the cable guard is not just there to take away torque, but it's also there to add torque. And in some setups, basically getting a bow to tune by moving things on the bow, all you're doing is either adding torque or taking torque away. You're trying to get the bow to rotate at the appropriate angle so that it'll tune the way that it sits in your hand. And your cable guard is probably the most powerful tool for doing that, you know, aside from spacing cams, moving back bars, moving front bars, you know, changing different grip plates and grip angles. Really, all you're trying to do is manipulate the rotation of that riser at full draw under load so that it points at an angle so the arrow will depart from it straight from your hands. Um, and then I'll get into, you know, setting up my, my scope, my sight, whatnot. Um, peep fit to scope. I'm going to want my, my peep to kind of halo my scope. So I've got like a 16th inch peep with no clarifier in it. I've got a Shibuya Oculus scope, which fits inside my peep really well. You know, indoors, I'm probably going to be running like a, a 0.7 or a 0.8 diopter, what they would call a, a six power. Uh, I'm going to put a black dot in there that's about the size of the Vegas 10 ring, maybe a little bigger. Uh, I'm going to level it up going to put my bars on there based on what I've been shooting on that kind of riser geometry over the last, you know, two and a half decades. And that's pretty much it for bow setup. I don't really get under the hood and do a deep dive on any of the bows that I'm shooting now. Cause frankly, I don't need to, um, everything's pretty plumb level and square. And for me, honestly, it's not the end of the world. If the bow won't shoot an absolute perfect bullet hole, or a perfect bear shaft. It's absolutely not the end of the world. There are things that are a lot more important. You know, number one, how well does the bow sit on the target under load when you're building resistance in the front half of the shot and the back half of the shot? Whatever it is you do to get the arrow to go from point A to point B, that bow has to be steady during that process. And all the tuning in the world isn't gonna help you if you can't stand there and shoot the shot and you don't have a bow set up properly so it will aim better under load you know that getting it to aim better under load there's a lot of attributes to that some of them first and foremost bow draw length itself loop length how long or short your loop is from the string if you have perfect bow draw length to fit your stature uh holding weight you know, do you need more? Do you need less, et cetera? So there's a lot of other variables that go into that other than just the core of the bow itself. And stabilization, stabilization kind of covers up a lot of those things. If you don't have proper bow draw length, proper loop length, and the right holding weight to match your biomechanics, all the stabilization in the world isn't going to help much. Um, the stabilization just kind of masks some of that stuff. So if you get the core fundamentals of building a bow to your physical form of biomechanics, it's pretty much going to aim really well, no matter what you do with stabilizers. So, so how, how do you fine tune and adjust your draw? Is it just trial and error um, and seeing, seeing how you're holding on, on, on time to time or is, is there another? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it used to be trial and error. I have a very specific set of measurements now because I mean, I finally, <laughs> At 44 years old, I finally stopped growing, I think. I'm probably to the point in life where I'm going to start shrinking. <laughs> but um, uh, it's a lot of trial and error. But some fundamental things you can see in your sight picture, in your shot timing and rhythm that are draw length clues, number one. Now, this is, bear in mind, if everything else is relatively close, your bar setup, your holding weight, your loop length, overall bow draw length, for me, first and foremost, fundamentally, if I have a sight picture that has a speed and tempo to it, a, 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 a timing of the oscillation that is slow and comfortable, but the range of motion is a little too big, that for me is an indication of a draw length that's too long. On the opposite side of that, if I have a range of motion that is really, really tight, but a speed and tempo to the sight picture that is too fast, and if there's any application change of force from front half to back half on that, 
the site will take a big dip or a big jump, that's usually an indication for me that a draw link's way too short. And for me, typically in training and practice, the longer I make my bows, the better they feel. But that has bit me in the backside so many times in tournaments uh, that I purposely, if I'm here training in my comfort zone in my little world here, and the bow feels just a little bit short and I'm tempted to make it just a little bit longer, I won't. And for me, when I'm talking draw length adjustments, I'm talking about a 16th of an inch here. I'm not talking huge, you know, half inch, quarter inch, full inch. I'm talking 16th of an inch, not, you know, literally half the width of a bowstring. That's a 16th of an inch. Um, and that's kind of my, my, my sweet spot. Now, with that said, though, draw length, not only, not only just draw length affects sight picture, but holding weight does too, okay? Um, now, some of the indications where, say, you have too much holding weight, the bow will be really super, super stable, but as soon as you apply load and force, it'll take a big, crazy jump. You know, so it's there. It has a good range of motion. It's got a little oscillation to it, and as soon as you apply force, it'll take a big dip or jump on you. You've probably got too much holding weight there. The other side of that, if you have too little holding weight, you're up there and the tempo is good, but the range of motion is too big. And over time, it finally gently slows down, slows down, slows down, slows down, but it just takes a lot longer than it would. You probably have too little holding weight. And holding weight adjustments for me are done in very small increments, literally a half a pound at a time, plus or minus. And there's a lot of tricks to getting your holding weight just right. And it's not just moving your draw stops because too many of these bow manufacturers will say, oh yeah, put it in this slot for, you know, 65%, put it in this slot for 70, put it in this slot for 75. All you're doing is manipulating the draw length and stopping the bow further up the valley on the draw force curve to manipulate it. So the real true way to manipulate your holding weight is to change your cable diameter, change your peak weight. And anytime you do any of those, you need to go back to the draw board and reset your draw length so that you're only changing one variable at a time. I, I, I do really appreciate the insight you offered me here, Dave. I think that's about all the questions I've got, and I don't want to take up any more of your time, but this was wildly educational, and I think that it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you for doing this. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye.